could you please introduce yourself? Well, my name is Alvaro. I'm from Europe and I work as an Ayurvedic consultant. And I'm here in Nepal because India is closed, basically. Uh, could you uh, explain about your experience, your journey, the circumstances uh, from which you uh, arrived here? Yes, uh, I wanted to run away from uh, Europe because it's getting a little bit dictatorial. Uh, so I wanted to go to India to see my guru. But India is closed, so I decided to come to Nepal, that is close to India. And uh, this way, if uh, they eventually open, I can go there. What about your experience about Eastern philosophy or Hinduism? Well, I've read the Vedas, Upanishads, uh, Ramayana, Mahabharata, these kind of things. Uh, and I like the histories, but I... I prefer my guru's approach, it's mm -hmm. maybe more logical, mm -hmm. makes uh, more sense for me. Mm -hmm. So, for me, uh, what we call Shiva is uh, our consciousness, okay? What we call Vishnu is the mind, and Brahma is the creation of the body. That's why you don't have temples to Brahma. There is nothing to worship here. You can uh, worship Vishnu as Raja as the mind and or Raja as the king. So that's why you you put garlands on him and very pretty clothes, things like that. And uh, for Shiva, it's the Sattva Guna, and that's why the Lingam, you just clean it. You put water on it, you know. So I have this approach. Then. What message uh, you would like to disseminate uh, to the people about uh, the Eastern philosophy or Hinduism? Well, it's quite a deep philosophy and uh, you go for Vedanta, uh, I think it's, it's good for many people. I mean, you need some... There are different ways in yoga. Every people don't need the same path, you know? And Hinduism, or what we call nowadays Hinduism, is something very wide. You will find very different people, very different beliefs. So it's such a big umbrella that sure you can find very good things, very good ideas. And the are, uh, for example, in the Upanishads or uh, many Vedanta texts of, I don't know, uh, Shankaracharya. It's very good text. Uh, there, are, uh, there is a deep knowledge here, that's for sure. But uh, there is also a lot of history that are just another way of communicating this knowledge. But they don't must be true, you know, it's just a way of talking about a deeper truth. Could you explain about Gorakhnath? No, I cannot. I, I'm not well versed on uh, his life or uh, his teachings. I guess he was an enlightened master and mm -hmm. the little I know about their practices mm -hmm. are even very similar to my Guru's practices. Mm -hmm. Because he also put the tongue on the pointing to Dromadia, all these uh, pranayama exercises. He did almost the same thing. Mm -hmm. But I can't not tell you nothing about Goragna because okay. I've been here very little then, time. Then can you explain uh, about Siva? I already did. Shiva is pure consciousness. It's the Sattva Guna, we could say. It's the purity, the equanimity. You know? so then you have uh, Rajas and Tamas. You know? But for me, Shiva is this. It's, uh, it's what is behind your life, let's say. You have a body, you have a mind, you have something else. You know? This else is Shiva. But it's not the personal Atma, let's say. It's not the Atma. It's Paratma. It's the, the biggest one. So. So what do you know about Nepalese culture? Very little. Very little. I, 
for me. It's similar to India, but uh, you eat more meat and they drink alcohol. And I don't like it. Do you know about Sivaratri? How it is, how is, how it is celebrated? What is the importance of Sivaratri? Yes, uh, Sivaratri is a, is a special date to get union with Shiva. But this union, as I told you before, is with your own self. It's not a union that you do with many people. I know here there is a very good gathering uh, and a very good energy, but this only has to lead you to an inner gathering with Shiva. No? So this is what I can tell you about Shiva Ratri. And what is your message uh, to the people of this world? Ah, start thinking a little bit. It's not so hard. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you tell about Eastern philosophy uh, to the people, uh, rest of this world? Well, I mean, Eastern philosophy or any kind of philosophy, if you really get to the point, they are all saving the same. They use different terminology, different histories, different ways of telling the same thing. So, you can go for any philosophy, but you must go deep enough. And you must use your brain for it. You must think about it. You don't must... You, it's not about believing what somebody says. Because somebody says their own truth, but if, if you're just repeating, it's totally worthless. So, any philosophy, if it's Eastern or Western or whatever, it's about finding the truth. The truth is only one. Yeah. So if your philosophy has any value, it must have reached this oneness. Mm -hmm. So that's it. That's, for me, there is no such difference. I mean, the difference is outside. Here you have blue gods, many arms, very fancy stories, and, but they all reflect a deeper meaning. And in other cultures, they use other examples with other people, but same symbology, same, many names even are similar. And the basic philosophy is the same, because there is only one truth. So if you have found it, then you can explain it in many ways. But it's about this one truth. So there are many religions, you know? Yes. Then. Uh, but their destiny is only one, to find the truth, you know? No, I mean, the truth has already been found. Yeah. The religion is only a way to express it, to communicate it. Yeah. You have an experience and then you write a book. Mm -hmm. If many people follow you, okay, you have a religion. Yeah. But this is only outside. Yeah. If you go inside of the message, if you are able to decipher it, you will get that truth. But even if you understand it, it's not enough. You must leave it. And that's why we practice yoga and this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much.